The great Gothic cathedral is obviously an important part of the architectural heritage of Northern Europe and Britain. The cathedral itself can be appreciated in a variety of ways. As an object, a massive object in the landscape when seen from a distance, and its sheer bulk dominating the city centre. Now apart from the devotional aspirations of its builders, and the essentially religious functional nature of the spaces within the building, the cathedral is itself an aesthetic treat and is rightly admired for the beauty of its stone carving and carpentry, exquisite stained glass and of course the music associated with the liturgy. But in this program we're going to look at the cathedral as a building, if you like, as a piece of structural engineering. We shall isolate its component parts and try and understand how they work. I think we can justify this apparently mechanistic approach to the subject by reminding ourselves that historically progress in building structure had traditionally been one of a series of slow, evolutionary and even cautious steps. New buildings were only slightly taller or wider than their predecessors. Builders always looking for a precedent as a prototype. But it's possible to argue that the emergence of the great Gothic cathedral in 12th century France was one of the most dramatic and important steps in the development of structural form. A system emerged with new structural elements and indeed a philosophy more characteristic of the 20th century. Now to understand the nature and the importance of the advance made by the Gothic builder it will be useful just briefly to look at the principal structural systems of antiquity. The architecture of ancient Egypt was characteristically that of post and lintel. Here the loads from the ends of horizontal beams or slabs is transmitted vertically into the foundations by columns or walls. This is also true of Greek architecture, where, as in Egypt, the arch was never used. In Roman engineering and architecture, the typical spanning element was the semicircular stone arch, and many splendid examples survive in Roman amphitheatres and water supply aqueducts. In using the semicircular arch for roofing buildings, which were rectangular in plan, the Roman designers used it in the form of the barrel vault. This system required a continuous line support from the walls, which had to be thick enough to resist the horizontal forces tending to push the walls apart. This system produced a characteristic dark interior to the building and a large expanse of wall space, which was often decorated with paintings. The cool and dark interior produced by Romanesque structure was eminently suited to the Mediterranean region. But with the construction of the Gothic cathedral in northern France and the need to admit more light to the interior of the building, those crucial developments were made which were to become known as Gothic. In France, at the beginning of the 12th century, there was nothing recognisably Gothic, and yet by the middle of the century it was already becoming very widely adopted. The term Gothic, incidentally, was only applied to the system much later and indeed as a term of abuse to describe something more typical of the Goths and Vandals and certainly not classical. Now we've come to the beautiful and structurally interesting Cathedral of Ely in Cambridgeshire and we shall now consider the, set the function of the separate elements of the Gothic structural system and to discover what each contributes to the stability of the building. The collection and transmission into the ground of vertical forces is no more of a problem in the Gothic cathedral than it was in the ancient structures of Egypt, Greece or Rome. The structural element that fulfills this function of course is the masonry column and they are always a distinctive feature of the cathedral interior. 
they're basically simple structures one course of stone piled on top of another from the foundation up to the springing of the arcade arches or the ribs of the vaults the joints are held always in compression that is uh, they are held together by the weight of the masonry above it follows therefore that the most heavily loaded stone is the one at the bottom of the pile below the floor here sitting on top of the foundations now it's interesting that if you do the calculations even that most heavily loaded stone we find is not highly stressed that is the load per unit of cross-sectional area is very small well within the crushing strength of the stone itself it follows therefore that these structural elements have really a large factor of safety in fact cathedrals don't fall down because the masonry crushes problems only really arise when you have foundation movement tension can develop joints can open and collapse could follow so on the whole then columns don't provide the main problems in cathedral structure more interesting in this respect are the arch spans of the choir, transept and nave. The arch spans horizontally, is curved and produces inclined forces on its supports. Each separate wedge-shaped block of stone is called a voussoir and rests against its neighbour and has to be supported on temporary timber centering until the last stone is in place and the buttressing system completed. The weight of the stone holds the voussoirs together and prevents tension developing at any joint face. In fact, the system could be described as being pre-stressed by gravity, and you could build a Gothic cathedral without any mortar between the stones. As we have seen, the Romans used only the semicircular arch with its fixed span rise ratio of two to one. And this was a great constraint on designers. On the other hand, the Gothic arch is essentially of pointed form and any combination of span and rise is possible. This simple development freed the planner from the fixed span rise ratio. This freedom greatly simplified the construction of Gothic masonry vaults, the three-dimensional form of the arch. Providing the rise here is the same as the rise here, then this span and this span need not be the same. These vaults are characteristic of the Gothic cathedral. To enclose the tops of the spaces within the Gothic cathedral, such as the choir, transept, nave, lady chapel or chapter house, an intricate stone ceiling was formed using this stone vaulting. The earliest, simplest type of vault was merely formed of two intersecting curved surfaces. These curved surfaces formed a sharp edge, and this type of vault was known as a groined vault. Later vaults became more refined and were constructed by first forming stone diagonal ribs and then filling the spaces between them with thin slabs of stone known as vault plates. Rib vaults became further elaborated by the introduction of additional ribs and two types are worth mentioning. The Tiersron rib rises from the springing to the ridge of the vault. It subdivides the panels reducing the span of the vault plates but it does complicate the column head junction. The Leern rib does not originate at the column head but runs between other ribs and these Leern ribs are largely an ornamental innovation. Ely has excellent examples of these Leern rib vaulted ceilings and particularly here in the Lady Chapel. This is the largest single span stone vaulted ceiling in Britain work began on it in 1321 and it was completed in the middle of the 14th century. You'll note that I describe these as ceilings and not as roofs. They were never used to keep out the rain. Above the decorated vault, the cavities are only roughly finished 
and they in turn are covered with the traditional timber frame pitched roof which is clad in either slate or lead. Next time you visit a Gothic cathedral, do look upwards at the great stone vaulted ceilings and admire the ingenuity of their construction. Now although these stone vaults contributed nothing to the weather tightness of the building, they did pose the architect and builder with his greatest structural problems, namely that of the arch action of the vault tending to push the tops of the walls outwards. This is a problem which could only be solved by ingenious buttressing. For single vault spans in separate or isolated buildings, such as the Lady Chapel here, vertical wall buttresses are all that is required. You'll notice that they are stepped and wider at the base to transmit the steeply inclined force into the ground. However, much more difficult problems occur when you wish to support the high vaults over the lower side aisles of a cathedral, as in the choir here. The space between the high vaults over the choir of the cathedral and the roof over the side aisles, which I'm now standing on, gave the Gothic designer yet another opportunity for admitting light into the building. The non-load-bearing part between the two columns could be filled with glass. And this device is known as a clear story. Now, the real structural problem of containing the inclined force from the high vaults of the cathedral was most elegantly solved by this device here. It is known as a flying buttress, and it enables the inclined force to be flown over the side aisles. Now, just think of the three-dimensional problem it posed, to find just the right inclined path in space and to build it in stone. It was a matter of experiment, of try it, and C. Where there are two flying buttresses, as here, it is the lower one that is taking the vault thrust, and recent experiments show that the upper one is merely taking wind loading. Now it is quite clear that the Gothic designer only adopted the flying buttress as a last resort when all else had failed. In order to turn the inclined thrust in the buttress down into the wall and hence eventually into the ground, a large mass of stone is added at the junction. A simple device is known as a pinnacle, and it is a functional part of the Gothic structural system, although it is often beautifully carved and decorated. Now, the empirical, practical nature of the flying buttress reminds us only too well that the great Gothic cathedral was not achieved without a great deal of trial and error, and sometimes accompanied by catastrophic failure. What we see today, in fact, are the successful survivors. In building a Gothic cathedral in the medieval period, the normal sequence of construction was to start at the east end by building the choir and installing the high altar. In that way, the embryonic building could be put into use as soon as possible. The transepts on the north and south sides were then built, and it was the ambition of the Gothic designer to surmount the crossing with either a very tall spire, as at Salisbury, or a massive stone tower. And it was here that really large structural problems were encountered. In the Norman building here at Ely, the crossing of the nave, transepts and choir was surmounted by a stone tower. But on the 12th of February in the year 1322, it collapsed, destroying the choir and severely damaging the transepts. It was considered impossible to rebuild the tower in the stone, and instead a magnificent octagonal timber lantern was designed, which in terms of engineering is really the glory of Ely Cathedral. So, in early 1322, the crossing here was a pile of stone, and much work had to be done. The rubble had to be cleared, no mean feat in itself, and new stone acquired from remote quarries to rebuild the choir in the then contemporary Gothic fashion and to repair the north and south transepts. And massive blocks of timber had to be acquired to construct the new proposed timber lantern. The ingenious framing of the lantern can be very clearly seen here in this model. The largest individual pieces are the eight corner posts forming the octagon. Each timber post is 63 feet long and weighs over 10 tons. They were brought 
from Bedfordshire by water transport across the Fens and delivered to the cathedral site. Having arrived here, they then had to be lifted through the crossing space and assembled in this position such that the bottom of the posts is 100 feet above the floor of the nave. The loads from the timber work are delivered down through these timber struts onto the eight columns, masonry columns, of the crossing. And the undersides of the struts are encased in decorative, non-load-bearing panelling. This is an impressive timber structure, supporting a load of 400 tonnes of timber and lead. Work began on the construction of the lantern in 1322, and it took about 24 years to complete. It is clear that the construction of the Gothic Cathedral, extending as it did very often over several centuries, required not only dedicated craftsmanship in masonry and timber, but also engineering ingenuity of a high order as demonstrated here in the Lantern at Ely. But above all this, it must have required very efficient site organisation and efficient management. The administrative team which evolved to deal with these management problems comprised the bishop, the dean and the chapter, a committee of monks or parish priests known as canons under the chairmanship of the dean. Now as the building of a cathedral extended over many years spanning the appointment of several bishops, it was the chapter committee that provided the essential continuity of management. The function of the chapter was firstly to find the funds to pay for the work, to select designers, supervise site work, keep accounts, and eventually to maintain the fabric of the building. The cathedral would first, of course, have to be designed. The ground plan was first decided upon, and then the elevations of walls and details of the roof. The design process was a mixture of trial and error, and an evolutionary collection of data based on experience and expressed as geometric rules of proportion. Archival research in the Cathedral Chapter Libraries of Europe has revealed drawings and stonemason's notebooks from the 13th century. These provide evidence that the placement of the structural elements and their proportions were determined by geometric constructions. These constructions were based on the square, equilateral triangle and the golden section. The proportions of this rectangle based on the golden section have had a continuing influence in European art and architecture. Having made the design of at least the first part of the building, work could begin on site and the design ideas had to be conveyed to the builders. The techniques used here included drawings, models, centering, templates and written specifications. Once building work began, the construction site was essentially such as we would find today, an atmosphere of noise and the bustling activity of many workmen, a scene of timber scaffolding, cranes, ropes and pulleys, and wagons delivering materials. The workforce would include labourers and a range of craftsmen, including scaffolders, carpenters, stonemasons and stone fixers, smiths working wrought iron, plasterers and glass and lead workers. The stonemasons were a highly organised, close-knit, secretive body of men, divided into guilds based on the various cities. They would work on site in the shelter of the Masonic Lodge, a medieval contractor's site hut. They would train apprentices and pass on the secrets of the Masons, largely the geometric rules of proportion. Some Masons were itinerant and were known as Freemasons. All this construction activity was supervised by the Bishop, the Dean and the Cathedral Chapter, and when the building was in use, they had responsibility for its maintenance. Every medieval cathedral has been extensively modified and adapted and repaired over the centuries. 
In this sense, the Gothic cathedral is never complete and requires continuous maintenance involving the skills of the modern craftsman, particularly those of the stonemason employed in the replacement of stone eroded by atmospheric weathering. It also involves the professional advice of the architect and the consulting structural engineer. And this could lead to massive and expensive engineering works involving specialized contractors. Recent examples include the work done to the foundations of York Minster, the replacement of stone at Westminster Abbey, and the engineering work on the West Tower at Ely Cathedral. With these problems in mind, I spoke to Peter Miller at Ely, who is surveyor to the fabric of the cathedral. Peter, I believe you are by profession an architect. That's right, yes. And how much of your professional time is taken up with caring for the fabric of the cathedral? Well, the bulk of the work is, is done in my office in Norwich uh, with the help of assistants but I come over to Ely usually once a week on Fridays. What um, recent major works have been done to the cathedral in an architectural and engineering sense? Well, the major, last major work, which was done in 1973 and 1974, was the repair and strengthening of the West Tower. And uh, we were very much helped in that by uh, Professor Hyman of Cambridge University, who is also the consultant engineer to the cathedral. Uh, what we really did was uh, strengthen the whole of the tower uh, and stopped any further outward movement. What was really happening was that the, um, at high level the four small turrets were pulling away from the central belfry and they, they've really been tied in now with steel reinforcement. Same time we repaired the stonework, uh, timber work, lead work and all the other jobs whilst we'd got scaffolding on the on the tower itself. Hmm. And what are your present problems occupying you? Problems for the future perhaps? Well, the worst, worst one in the cathedral is the North Navar roof. Uh, this is the oldest um, roof in the cathedral, we think about 200, 250 years old. I've now got 400 uh, patches of uh, tape on it to try and keep the water out. Uh, we've got an estimate for doing the work, which is about a quarter of a million, and uh, it can't be put in hand because the dean and chapter haven't got any money for this particular project. The three or four other projects, there's the south transept here, uh, where the hammer beam roof is spreading. And this is another job where Professor Hyman will be helping us by uh, grouting the um, uh, stonework, tying together the timber framework, and again uh, de dealing with the, um, all the high-level repairs whilst we've got the scaffolding about. Work for a few years yet, then, I should think. Uh, ten, <laughs> or forever, I suppose, really. Thank you. Well, to summarise, then, the Gothic system emerged in France in the 12th century and most of the innovative developments took place in the High Gothic period between 1140 and 1284. The complex system comprising columns, vaults, buttresses and pinnacles evolved empirically and are further evidence the fact that practice almost invariably preceded the theory which explained why it worked. It also reminds us that any structure is only as good as its foundations. The rules of geometric proportion were codified by the end of the 13th century and became part of that secret of the masons which was passed on from master to apprentice. But the principal contribution of the Gothic system to the techniques of construction was the development of the skeletal stone frame or cage and that separation of the two essential functions of building structure. Firstly, the system that transmits the load into the ground and the second system which defines the space and excludes the weather. This of course is the philosophy of the half-timbered cottage where the exposed timber work is load-bearing and the infill panels are merely there to exclude the weather. This structural philosophy can be ignored in the domestic scale building and was also largely done so in the functional buildings of the early industrial revolution. But it had to be reintroduced for the tall multi-storey steel and concrete frame structures of the 20th century. Now, I think it's possible that the large and very expensive buildings of any period tell us much about the society that built them. And of course in this respect the Gothic Cathedral is important not only for what it tells us about religion, cultural values, art and craftsmanship, but also, as I hope we have shown in this program, is valuable for what it tells us about the development of structural form and building technology.